So we're going to cover 12 different things. At the end of the video, I'm actually going to deliver to you 15 things that you can action actionably do after this video to stop you making these mistakes. OK, so not only are there 12 things that we're going to get into today, uh, biases that we get into today, but also 15 actionable things you can do as well. Um, and if you do want to download this document for yourself, um, you can fill out the form in the description. Click the link in the description, fill out the form and we'll send it over. So let's get into it, shall we? So the first, well, let's let's list them out that we're going to read. We're going to go through the sticky first glance trap. We're going to go through echo chamber, sheep leap syndrome, rose tinted rear view, confirmation bias, sand head stuffing, ha hindsight high five, macho mirage, pla placebo effect, loan success, selective perception, and the blind spot bias. We're going to go through all of those in this video. So let's get into the big 12, shall we? Let me just check that we're recording here and we're all fine. Okay, let's get into the big 12. So the sticky first glance trap um, really is the tendency to rely too heavily on the first piece of information that you see. This is called the anchor. Um, and so this is actually called the anchor bias. I've called it the sticky first glance trap. It's a bit of a mouthful, but it's okay. Um, and this really kind of relates to the idea that, you know, the first thing we see, that's what we're going to go for. Um, and that, that kind of really shapes our biases in these things. So I've got an example for you. Um, there's a car salesman, for example, and you go to the dealership and you say, and he says, well, this car is worth £20,000. And you say, oh, that's really cheap, right? <laughs> and, and you think, okay, well, you've thought that's cheap. Why have you thought that's cheap? Like, against what? And so you might have looked online and you might have gone to another dealership and looked at the exact same car and it was £30,000 and you thought that was okay at that time but then you went to the next place and it was cheaper and you thought oh it's cheap. One of those is the right value or maybe neither of them are the right value for the fair market value but because of your first experience you believe that to be you know a cheaper price. It's just the same with with cryptocurrency. If you see you know Bitcoin at $100 depending on where you see that $100 in time, you would say it was either really expensive or really cheap. If you're in 2008, $100 is really expensive. But if you see it now, <laughs> when the prices are up at like $60,000, you think that's really cheap. So it's about understanding this first glance that you have, this anchor piece of information that you have and recognizing where you are in, in the scheme of things, just so you don't get kind of, uh, you know, fud it out or you get too excited. You don't want either of those things in making decisions. So you will make poor decisions. You'll also hold on to assets for too long um, because of the, uh, due to an, an initial high price. So if you've bought the price higher, you'll hold on for it for too long. Um, and then obviously the value of that goes down. And then also you'll miss out on opportunities by waiting for for an opportunity for the price to return to where it was. And so, that gets you in loads of trouble there. And there was one quote, uh, quote here from Ben Stein, or Stein, Ben Stein. The first step to getting things you want out of life is this, decide what you want. And this is obviously showing the importance of setting clear investment goals and really cautioning against allowing initial impressions to cloud your judgment and decision making. Um, and so with all of these, we're gonna not only just give you you know, explanation of what I'm talking about here, but also an example with uh, any studies that have been done, then quotes, and then also things that you can do to mitigate against these things happening to you. So you can regularly update your market knowledge. That means just keep up, keep informed, keep up to date. And it's also really important to seek varied opinions um, because that will often challenge your initial assumptions and things. Um, and then one really, really interesting thing is to have predefined investment criteria that aren't just price. So if you're making sure that you're, you know, looking at an investment landscape, looking at the market in general, if you have a massive red day, um, it's not just about the price, it's about understanding that typically on red days, there are better opportunities to buy. And so if that's one of your predetermined or predefined investment criteria, then that's really, that's obviously a really good thing. Um, next, we have the echo chamber bias. 
Now the echo chamber bias is the tendency to overestimate the likelihood of events based on their ease of recall. So for example, and I'll give, an, I'll give a tremendous example here for the XRP crowd. You know, if you look at, for example, um, a set price for XRP, that means the price of the XRP token is has a predetermined price that it just will go to when utility turns on. Now, if you continue to talk about that, and you talk to, with people who think that's going to happen, and that's all the people you talk to, you're creating an echo chamber where you end up overestimating the likelihood of that happening, even if it's not possible. So for example, if you there was a whole ESDR conversation where you get XRP actually being used as a currency, as a basket of currencies in the world, instead of like the dollar and, and the pound, you would have XRP and different CBDCs. If you talk with people just about that, you can get worked up and start to think that is what's going to happen. We've overestimated the likelihood of that happening. But what you don't realize is that the public cannot own ESDRs, right? So you, you would actually be missing out on that side of things. Um, and that brings in the conversation of like a, of a buyback and all that kind of stuff. But I'm not trying to get anyone angry in here. So you end up prioritizing investments based on the recent news or what's most discussed rather than having a comprehensive analysis, really big one to not fall into. So there was actually a study in 1991 about this, where it demonstrated the participants rated diseases as more pre prevalent when they could more easily recall instances of them. And that's obviously highlighting how ease of recall influences perceived probability. So for example, if you didn't get COVID and you didn't know anyone that got COVID, COVID didn't exist for you. You know, so you, or if you only watch the news, even though even if you didn't get COVID or no one that you had had COVID, no one you knew had COVID, you were watching the TV and it was just selling, telling you everyone's got COVID, then you're going to lean more towards your, what you're being told. You're living in an echo chamber. And so it's this is an interesting quote from Mark Twain about this. It's not what we don't know that gets us into trouble. It's what we know for sure that ain't so being so focused on something that you believe is true and it's just not true um, it's a way better position to be in to be the uh, opposition to be the the one that's curious and asking questions and so in order to mitigate echo chamber bias you want to diversify your your information sources so look beyond the news look beyond social media actually try and get into source documentation like if you're if you're looking at money and payments you might want to look into like the banking documentation use that stuff um, to to kind of educate yourself and it will move you away from that echo chamber bias you also you'll see this pop up a few times here in this video but having a long-term view of things is way better than using recent events to make your in make your decisions um, next just try to be critical in your thinking uh, challenge the perceived importance of widely discussed topics by seeking out counter arguments and data. So actively asking the questions, actively opposing um, to make your, your decision in the end. Next is the sheep leap syndrome. And the sheep leap syndrome is a cognitive bias where individuals adopt beliefs or behaviors because they perceive that the majority of people do the same. I think there's a lot of this in, in crypto. I really, really do. Um, we've we've had it a lot where um you know people will deliberately focus on what influencers say are saying or if there's a hot topic at that moment they'll just prioritize it as a more important thing that's happening even though it's it might just not be right and so you've really got to understand how prioritizing these things really gets you into into some trouble and so it can lead to uncritical following of trends and investment in assets simply because they're popular without proper evaluation of their intrinsic value. Now, this is a, a lot of this is like the whole um, stronghold, SHX stronghold thing. You know, just because loads of people are talking about it doesn't mean the intrinsic value of the asset is, is more or less. Um, you know, just because people are talking about it doesn't mean we should also just confirm it and just jump in like sheep, right? And so there was actually even a study about this. It's so interesting how many studies are done about these things that directly impact from a psychological standpoint the crypto market and how we should navigate. I've just been fascinated by this recently. 
So Solomon Asher's conformity experiments in the 1950s, these experiments showed that individuals would conform to the majority opinion even when it was clearly not correct, highlighting the powerful influence of the perceived social norms on decision making. People have done studies about this, guys. They've studied that people will even conform when the thing that they're conforming to is clearly incorrect. These things have been psychologically proven. Why, is, why would crypto be any different? Why would we be any different? We're not. The person who follows the crowd will usually go no further than the crowd. The person who walks alone is likely to find themselves in places no one has ever seen before. Even Einstein understood, understood this theory. And so, you know, don't give so much credence to what people are saying. And, and people are saying at mass. So if loads of people are talking about a topic, it doesn't mean it's any more valid, uh, more or less valid, right? Just because people are talking about it, do your own independent research. This is what would to mitigate sheep leap syndrome. Um, do your independent research. Make sure you're doing a thorough ana analysis rather than looking at popularity. Some people can use popularity and hype and sentiment in their favor. I think that's a really difficult skill to have. I prefer to have more of like a analysis view than trying to judge sentiment. Um, and then also seek out a variety of opinions um, so you don't get caught in these echo chambers. And again, long-term strategy. Think long-term rather than short-term. So then we've got the rose-tinted rear view. We're going to start getting through these as quickly as possible to get to the 15 things that we can be doing right now that will stop all of these things happening to us. Um, this is the rose tinted rear view. And this bias occurs when individuals favorably remember their decisions, ignoring or downplaying the negatives. Now, I will say that again. We, we look at the positive out that we look, we look at the things that we did in the past as really positive rather than addressing the negatives that we've, that we did. And as a result, we never actually improve because we blind ourselves with what's happened in the past. Again, scientifically studied and determined in a study by Matha, Shafir and Johnson in, in the year 2000, participants showed a preference for previously made choices. And it's a phenomenon that can impair an investor's ability to objectively reassess their portfolio. So just because you bought something in the past and you think it was a good decision or maybe the, the price went up for that asset doesn't mean it should still be held, <laughs> you know? Um, but you look at your decisions that you made in the past, even if you made decisions for in a, in a bad way, like you, you made a bad decision but got lucky, you will look at that decision-making process as positive, like you did a good job. Um, and that can impair your an investor's ability to objectively reassess the portfolio, as I said. And... Uh, Dana Akuri said, when we are stuck in a rut, we are being invited to grow and expand. So rather than looking at the positive outcomes of things, look at it as look at results as an opportunity to look back and reassess and adjust and improve. Um, rather than blindly justifying your past decisions. I think that's really, really important. So in order to mitigate that, we need to regularly reevaluate our choices in investments and look at it, try to look at them with fresh eyes. Like, okay, let's relook at this. Let's, let's reassess this asset, blah, blah, blah. And then it's also just good to make a list um, of all the cons of your investments as well, not just the pros. So uh, an example of that would be, a pro would be the price went up. The con, I had to wait four years, <laughs> you know? So you have to, it's good to do both sides of the list rather than all of the positive things that have happened. The next one, which you might have heard about, is confirmation bias. And this, bu this bias leads individuals to seek, interpret, and recall information that confirms their pre-existing beliefs, potentially causing investors to overlook critical contrary data. Um, now, Nickerson did this in 1998. Again, another study that did show this exact thing. It provided a com comprehensive review on confir confirmation bias, demonstrating its influence across various decision-making scenarios and included financial investments. In this study, included financial investments. So you can actually go and look at that, just type Nickerson 1998 um, confirmation bias, and it'll show you the study there. Um, 
I think it's very self-explanatory. If you believe something to be true and more information comes out about that, that feeds into your, into your belief, you're just going to continue to believe it. Again, creating like an internal echo chamber. The human understanding, when it has once adopted an opinion, draws all things else to support and agree with it. That's from Francis Bacon. So, you know, these, these elite people that will go down in history all understand these biases that we have. Um, and this is only five of 12. So, you know, there's lots of things that we do that are really getting in our way. Um, and I, I can attest to that, you know, if you see anything about XRP at one point, anything that XRP that comes in, even if it's like negative, you can draw that back into XRP and see how it's positive for XRP. Sometimes that's useful because it increases confidence, but sometimes it's it's just not necessary. Um, and so that's why it's good to definitely look for active contrary uh, uh, evidence. So look for information that challenges what you think. Um, and also just consume lots of different content, right? Lots of different people from all the, all the sides. Um, the next one's really interesting because they kind of all feed in together. And that is sand head stuffing. Now, this is actually called the ostrich bias. And this is the tendency to ignore negative information or like warnings. Um, you might disregard bad news or bad information um, and only look at the, the positive things. And this is just like, like it's called the ostrich bias, putting your head in the sand and disregarding all the bad news. Um, now, again, another study. Um, Galai and Said in 2006 explored the ostrich effect in financial markets. How, I mean, how specific do you want it? <laughs> they explored the psychological thing in financial markets in 2006, finding that investors often avoid acknowledging losses and that impacted their decision making. And Albert Einstein comes up again. We cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. And that's obviously talking about the danger of ignoring negative information and urging us to face the realities and adapt our strategies accordingly. Um, we have to look at both sides. Look at the positives and the negatives here um, in, in everything that you're doing. In order to do that, try to keep up to date with the market and try to have a habit of objective, emotion-free analysis of your, of your crypto. Try not to get emotionally attached. Um, number seven is the hindsight high five. Judging a bet, now this is all about judging a decision based on its outcome rather than the quality of the decision at the time. So in crypto, this can lead to misattributing mis success to a skill rather than luck. And I said that earlier, right? You can invest in something and it wasn't really skill or research or understanding that got you that asset. You just kind of got lucky and it went up. Um, but if we look at that asset that went up as like, oh, we made a really good decision, that might not necessarily be the case. And it's just about really understanding uh, understanding that difference and being aware of it that, that I'm trying to kind of uh, let you know about today. So in another study, Barron and Hershey in 1988 demonstrated that individuals often evaluate decisions based on outcomes, neglecting the decision-making process's quality. So I know I'm just summarizing what the, what the study did, but understand these are the conclusions that they came to psychologically. You often evaluate decisions based on the outcomes, not the decision-making process. And Nelson Mandela even said, do not judge me by my success, judge me by how many times I fell down and got back up again. And that obviously encourages us to focus on the decision-making process and learning from it rather than the outcomes of the investment. So in order to do that, you really have to focus on developing good decision-making processes. So this is why, you know, I made a video a little while ago, uh, my, one of my last videos about how to research. It, no one watched that video because everyone thinks that's boring, but it's actually a process for you to go through with it, like a checklist. When I'm researching, does it tick this box? Yes, 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 yes. If it doesn't tick that box, maybe it shouldn't be an investment that you're getting into. So actually developing these processes like I'm doing on this channel is so important to avoid so many of these issues that we're talking about in today's video. Um, and then also it's whenever anything happens, reflect on it. You know, we've heard a lot of people do these investment journals where you any decision you make or however you feel that day, you're writing down 
in a journal so that you can reflect on these decisions and see if these decisions were made emotionally or objectively. And so those are things you can do to remove the hindsight, hindsight high five bias. The next one is the macho mirage, and this is overestimating one's own ability, uh, leading to greater risk taking. Investors like us might overvalue our knowledge, leading to poor investment choices. Um, I think we all we can all we all fall for that. <laughs> we all think we're we're more we all think we're smarter than we are, and we all kind of make at, we convince ourselves of that fact or that assumption. And then we make bad decisions. Um, Moore and Healy, again, focused on this in 2008, and they highlighted the prevalence of this macho mirage that I called it in various tasks, including financial predictions. Again, another study specifically with financial predictions showing that it often leads to errors in judgment. So the greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance. It's the illusion of knowledge. And that was Stephen Hawking. Stop thinking you're the best. <laughs> remove all of that kind of confidence that you have and just assess things um, objectively. Really, really try and do that. Um, because our confidence and our overestimation um, will end up getting you wrecked. So seek feedback from more experienced people. So you know, I don't know how you do that, maybe on social media or maybe you, you do a consulting call with someone, I don't know. Um, but you can get feedback on your own strategies and they can come from a different angle, um, shoot you down if you're too confident or build you up if you're not confident enough. You know, you, just having that outside opinion sometimes is quite useful. Um, and then another one that I highlighted deliberately here was, you know, you can employ a strict risk management technique. Um, and really this is what I focused on uh, heavily in the, in the exit strategy workshop where we actually have a risk management kind of, uh, matrix where you can figure out where you are on the risk tolerance thing so you can manage your risk as you build out your your plan super super helpful and of course will mitigate against this macho mirage that i've talked about now this is one that everyone knows obviously the placebo effect is very very important um and believing this is and if you don't know believing a crypto asset will succeed merely because you believe in it similar to how a placebo works in medicine can lead to investing based on hopes rather than evidence. So just like when you give sugar pills to someone and tell them it's ibuprofen and the headache goes away, it's not, um, that, that can be of benefit, right? Because we can, almost, our bodies can almost heal ourselves. But when we're looking at financial decisions, which is probably why there have been no studies in this, um, you know, we can often believe it so much and we think it's gonna succeed because we believe it and it doesn't quite work like that outside. Now you can kind of bring that in slightly to kind of like, um, what do you call it? Manifestation and vibrations and the universe and all of that kind of stuff. You know, you can have a vision board and you can manifest those things into becoming reality. So in some way, the belief can help the thing actually happen. But I think if we're looking at a wider audience here watching this video, you might not be all about that kind of vibrational manifestation thing. Um, the, you know, the placebo effect is an, is an interesting one to look at. And William James said, belief creates the actual fact. So just because you believe it makes it a fact to you. Um, now, whether it's whether that's true to other people is a whole different thing. Um, and so couple of things you can do to mitigate against the negatives of this is to ensure all of your investment decisions are backed by data and research rather than like a vibe. Um, crit and then you can critically evaluate or scrutinize the actual performance of your potential investments independent of what you personally believe. So again, using data and research to do that. Next, we're going to talk about loan success. So focusing on only the successes while ignoring the failures, um, crypto investors might only consider the stories of massive gains, disregarding the more common losses. Yeah, so you can often like warp your perception of the world just looking at the massive gains, like, oh, the guy that made $4 billion in, in Shiba Inu, forgetting that basically everyone else in Shiba Inu lost, <laughs> which is millions and millions of people. Um, and so that's just not useful, I don't think, uh, for, for investing. Now, Tversky and Kahneman 
1974 also touch upon aspects of this lone success thing that I'm talking about, where success stories are more readily available and memorable than failures. So, you know, we talked about that a little bit, a little bit higher up. Now, Winston Churchill said, success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. So you will get a more comprehensive view of the whole market if you if you consider both the successes and the failures in the market. And that goes for you as well. So in order to mitigate that, you can obviously study successful and unsuccessful investments just to get a really balanced understanding. And you want to set realistic expectations based on a wide range of outcomes. This is why in my exit strategy workshop, we focused on exit points that weren't just price, but also maybe date or event based uh, targets. And so, you know, you can set these expectations and you're not kind of all in on one um, and, and kind of get blinded to the idea that everyone wins because in a market, not everyone wins. Very few people win. The vast majority lose. So then we've got the selective perception. Um, this is the tendency to only see what you want to see and fil filter out contrary information. We've actually gone over this a few times. These are all different things, different studies, um, but they all kind of feed back in, you know. Um, this is like the, the availability heuristic that we talked about earlier. I don't know if I said it like that. Um, but it just means we ignore the warning signs in the end and we end up making really bad decisions. So Hasdorff and Cantrell in 1954, in their study on selective perception, showed that individuals' desires and beliefs significantly influence their perception of facts, um, often ignoring facts. And so that's a real problem. We see things not as they are, but as we are. We see things from our perspective, not from an objective perspective. Now you can try to be objective, of course, um, and I think in order to do that, you've got to have an open mind and be willing to adjust your views. Um, and then you also have to seek out actively, seek out and consider different perspectives than your investments. I think that's the only way to get that level, that level view. Now, the final one is the blind spot bias. This is the belief that you are less biased than others, which can lead to overlooking one's own cognitive biases in decision making, including in crypto investments. So Pro, uh, Pronin, Lynn and Ross in 2002 found that individuals recognize biases in others more than themselves, underestimating their own susceptibility. Everyone is a moon and has a dark side, which he never shows to anybody by Mark Twain. If you haven't gathered already, there's this, there's the, there's a problem in investing and the problem is us. We, we are overconfident. We, we think we're better than others. We think we're less biased. You know, we think everyone else is wrong and we are right. And for a lot of it, you know, I think like following your gut is a really important thing. There's many elements of investing that I think are important to follow your gut on. But we have to be aware that we also have this side to us where we just think we're better. You know, I'm better than everyone. Everyone must be wrong. Um, and I just think that's that's dangerous. So we have to really try to have some self-reflection, re reflect on your own decision making, have that journal and, and reflect on it as time goes on. Um, and then you can also use different advisors or tools or checklists to, to make sure that your decision making processes are objective um, and, and come from lots of different locations. So with all of those, you know, we've covered all of the things in this. These things take a long time to make, by the way. We've, we've talked about all 12 of the biases that we have and how they impact our crypto investments and how that negatively impacts our crypto investments. And so now you're wondering, well, what can I do right now to stop doing these things? Well, here's a quick list. I'm going to read them out. I think you should be regularly updating your market knowledge, stay informed, you know, looking at all of the things that are happening. So just stay up to date. You need to diversify your information sources, stay out of echo chambers, make sure that you're looking at lots of different people from all sides of the table, conduct independent research. That means go out by yourself and try to understand it yourself. Um, keep having, have like a review process where you go through your investments um, every so often and analyze them with fresh eyes. You want to also seek other evidence. So if you have one really strong thought on something that you believe is fact, find evidence for the other side, 
um, and that will bring you into a more neutral position, then you want to want to, that will then allow you to maintain a balanced perspective on things. Look at the pros and the cons of all of your investments. Then we also want to develop a habit of objective analysis, meaning you can analyze your investments based on data rather than emotions. You can then also seek feedback from people. So get an understanding from other people. You want, this is all about the macho mirage that you want to reduce. You want to see what everyone else is thinking. Then you want to also employ a strict risk management uh, technique or have a system to reduce risk. Again, my exit strategy workshop goes through all of that. Then we want to ensure all of our decisions are backed by data. So if we have a thought, have a feeling, get into the research, look at the data. Does the data confirm what I believe or not? regardless of the answer, understand that data is really strong and emotions can sometimes get you in trouble. Number 11 is that you want to set realistic expectations because you have to understand that not all of your your investments will, will go up in value. Um, and so in order to kind of combat against that, just make sure you're setting realistic expectations in your price targets and all of that kind of stuff. Again, the Exit Strategy Workshop goes over that in full. Um, then number 12, you can also approach all information with an open mind. So try not to be in that echo chamber of yourself, open mind. When something comes in, try to look for the alternative op uh, opinion and try to balance it where you feel in your gut. Number 13, you can regularly reflect on your decision-making processes. So if you've got all of this process, the process might be leaning towards an emotional process that you made before, and you might be more objective now analyze those processes that you've made and and make sure that they uh, are just reflected on you might you might need to make changes you might not then use external checks so you can leverage tools for objective perspectives on decisions so have a wide variety of different outlets that you look for your information and then finally of course focus on your decision making process constantly evaluate the quality of your decisions whether that's journaling or making sure that your decisions are based on your own risk tolerance, based on things that you want in your desired lifestyle versus your current lifestyle. And all of those things that I've just mentioned are all in my exit strategy workshop. If you take the workshop and you go through it and you think that was rubbish, <laughs> I didn't get any value from that, I will give your money back. There's a 30 day money back guarantee. There's no risks you taking. It's 147 pounds to get started. We actually do on the 13th of March. So in just nine days, we have a check-in with all the people who took the program before. They've, they've added the 30-day checkup uh, at checkout. And we're going to do a live Q&A to, to assess everyone's strategies and plans that they've been making over the last month to, to see how everything's going. So this is one of that la those last opportunities for you to actually be on that live Q&A call on the 13th of March as well. But the workshop is available for you to take any time from here on out. Um, it's really four hours of content, it can take you 90 minutes just to listen to me talk about it. You get free access to a whole load of documents and, and tools and resources to put this all together. So I think it's one of the more valuable things you can be doing. Of course, I built it, so I think it's really cool. But the overwhelming amount of good feedback says the same thing. People have been brought to tears by this thing um, with the stress relief. Um, so that's it. Those are all the things we can be doing to stop us being poor and put us more aligned on the mentality and the actions of people who actually make money in crypto. If you enjoyed this, hit the subscribe button, hit like on your way out. Um, links are in the description. Stay emotionless. I'll see you in the next one.